What is up, Church by the Glades? Man, it's the first Sunday in like three weeks. It has not been raining like crazy on a Sunday. So thank you for being here. And by the way, if you did stay home, listen, I'm not being judgy here, but just thinking this through with you, you do go to work when it rains. You do ask your kids to go to school when it rains. Well, now, why? Obviously, because, you know, your income, that paycheck's important, education's important, but God's important. So on the eighth day, God created this thing called the umbrella. Use it and show up. Man, we had a great time the last couple of weeks, rain or not, but I'm so thrilled you're here today. If you've missed last few weeks, we're in the middle of a relationship study. We've chosen the title, This Is Us. It's kind of a tip of the hat to a popular TV show, maybe you watch it, you know, it deals with all the other drama and the beauty and the satisfaction and the struggle of interpersonal relationships. So this is us. We have invite cards, but we also, because some of you guys thought that was a little, I don't know, cutesy, tame, not as kind of in your stuff as we typically are. We, we suggested an alternative title to the series, uh, Bay's Besties. And booty calls, bays, besties, and booty calls. And actually, we have invite cards for that as well. Now, be careful when you invite someone what you're inviting them to when you give them this one. But uh, just to say, too, if that was my three-point sermon I mentioned at CBG, I'm just trying to deal with the things that you were trying to navigate relationally. But to be clear, we are in favor of bays. We are in favor of besties. You need those good friends to make it in life. Uh, we are not endorsing booty calls. Not in favor of booty calls. We're anti-booty call at Church by the Glades, in case you're confused. They're not even clapping for that, so I'm concerned. <laughs> oh, too late, too late, too late. Anyways, just to be clear, but listen, I was thinking this one through because we reach a great cross-section of people, and maybe, you know, a lot of you guys would agree with that, but maybe some others are like, well, well why? What is the big deal about sex? I mean, you know, David's sex is just... This physical thing, it's a fun thing, doesn't have to mean anything, it's, it's enjoyable. So what's wrong with, you know, friends with benefits? What's wrong with, you know, meeting somebody on Tinder and hooking up? What, what's wrong with, you know, hitting it and quitting it? What is the issue? <laughs> Didn't think I knew that phrase. <laughs> In fact, you know, why, why is, it, why is it that you Christian people, I think you believe like sex is just like for marriage or something. That's so limited, that's, that's so out of date now. That why? Now listen, I, I was thinking it through, and you guys know I love the question, why? I'm never offended by a good, honest, why question. Now, some people just ask why, and they just want to argue and debate. That, but if you really want to find the right answers together, really want to discover truth together, I, I embrace why. Why is great. So someone goes, so why is it? Why is it? Because well, I know about you know, like the Bible and what God thinks. God's really anti that stuff. And God, so much let God know the sex is fun. But it seems like, yeah, back there. <laughs> But it seems like, you know, the Bible, God is, thou shalt not do this, and God shall not do that. If it's fun, you know, God's not for it. If it's fun, God says, you know, no, no. In fact, why do we need a big, fat, giant Bible? This Bible has 1,100 pages. I mean, God could have saved us a lot of time and trouble and just sent us a text message with one word, no. That seems like it's his favorite word. No, 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 don't you dare. Don't. Thou shalt not, right? No, God's the... Big God of no. Why? Why is he kind of anti-sex, anti-fun? I want, I want to jump into that with you. I want to have a candid conversation on the issue of sexuality. I want to talk, we're talking about relationships. I want to talk about the relationship between you and your sex drive. This is going, oh my gosh, really? We're, we're going to talk about that right here in church? We're going to have that? That's kind of awkward. I, I wish it was raining. I wouldn't have come. I... Yeah, in fact, to ramp up the conversation, let me think of an image, an image that, that drips with sexuality, a metaphor. How, how, about, how about a bed, a bed? Because we use language like this. Instead of saying sex, we say, I went to bed with her. I slept with him. So tech team, I hate to hit you guys up on the fly here, but I know you guys have extensive files. Do you have any image of a bed you can put on the screen that helps us think of sex? Okay, not that one. That's no help. Anything else? Anything else? What do you have? What do you have? What, okay, no, too kitty. Anything more grown up? More grown up. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Giant bed picture on the stage, right? Giant bed as we talk about sex. As we use that kind of language in our culture, I slept with him. I went to bed with her, right? Uh, in fact, do you guys have anything that's even a little more provocative than that? 
Anything? Find something. Find something quickly. If you're watching online, it's like really awkward in the room right now. People are a little uncomfortable. There's someone whispering to their first time guest like, he doesn't normally put pictures like that on the screen. I think the reason we find that just kind of weird or out, out of step or even distasteful is, is this, is what's missing in our world. Why our world is so confused on the issue of human sexuality is this. The church has been absent from the cultural dialogue. Now, now they're not asking for our opinion either. It's almost like they think we shouldn't really talk about this because all you do have, if any message, it's no, it's thou shall not, right? So the, the, church, the world has kicked the church out of the bed. But at the same time, we're reticent to talk about it. We're afraid to talk about this very real, very human relational topic. So while the world has kicked the church out of the bed, we've kicked the bed out of the church. So to quote the eminent theologian Justin Timberlake, I'm going to say something today. In fact, to quote Professor Timberlake again, I'm going to bring sexy back to the Word of God where it belongs. So I want to give you a biblical framework on sex. And if you are here still going, why? Why are we talking about this topic? Why? I don't get it. Two reasons. One, of course, it's relevant. Oh, my gosh, we live in a world and society steeped in sexuality. It's everywhere. It's media. It's, it's in the high schools. It's in the middle schools. It's in the elementary schools. Where everyone's talking about this. I mean, we live in this sex-obsessed society. You know that already. What you may not know is the Bible talks about sex a lot. It's not just a couple thou shall not verses. Sexuality is a theme throughout the Scripture. In fact, there's a book in your Bible, one whole book, devoted to sex and marriage. And by the way, if you read it in English, it'll make you blush. You read it in Hebrew, it's almost pornographic. I mean, it is candid. So I want to give you a biblical framework on what the Bible teaches about sex. I dare you to take notes today. I hope you will. And before I, I, I get into that, let me just say, before I, I'll take that image down. But first, as soon as you see an image like that, I know the moment I put that on the screen, in this room, in our campuses, a number of different thoughts came to your mind. Like some people see, they see a bed and you think about relationships. You think about intimate romantic relationships. Maybe you think about your spouse. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you think about your bae. I'm not sure what you're thinking of. You think relationships. Uh, someone else, you think about a bed. You think about a romp. You're kind of that mindset. Hey, you know, sex, it's no big deal, man. It's just this physical thing. If I sleep with different people, I'm not hurting anybody. We're consenting adults. I mean, so I do bounce from bed to bed. I don't think it's an issue whatsoever. Other people, you look at bed, you don't think relationship or romp. You think Rest. I'm so tired all the time. I'm, I'm just exhausted. Oh, man, I'm, I work too hard. I work too long. I love my bed and my mama, right? I just think rest. And then, and then uh, finally, a lot of us think about a bed or sexuality or an image like that, and we think, we think regret. Regret. In fact, give me a moment here because I want to I take some of the tension out of the room. Anybody here who's an adult, and probably most of the teenagers, you have some degree of regret over some sexual choice you've made. Maybe a bunch. Oh, if you're watching on TV, look, like six people clapping awkwardly. One brave person raising her hand. That's it. That's it. But I'm just trying to be, be honest. The reason we deal with topics that we deal with is I, I, this is no good to you. This is not powerful or transformative unless I get up on your stuff. But here, I'm not doing that in a way to be judgmental at all. We all have varying degrees of regret over something sexually, right? Maybe you've not even been sexually active at all. You're, 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 but you know, you had sexual thoughts or lust or seen pornography. And so there's, there's some shame or there's some guilt. And we're, if there's a continuum of regret, we all fall somewhere in that spectrum. Let, let me illustrate it this way in this room. I know we have a bunch of campuses, but just stay with me, campuses. Let's like pretend over in this section right here is the most sexually pure person in the house. Uh, pretend like Billy Graham came back to life and he's sitting right there next to Mother Teresa, okay? Right there, there. And uh, they're, they're awesome people and godly people and they're in heaven right now. But they would tell you candidly, though Billy Graham was always faithful to his wife, right? He didn't commit adultery. He would tell you he struggled with sexual thoughts. So they're like really pure, but even they would have some small degree of sexual regret. And let's pretend like this section, I'm making this up right now, are people who've made very few sexual mistakes, but we all have at least a little bit of regret so you're on one side of this continuum, and let's run over here, and we'll pretend like this section. This section's people who've made a whole bunch of sexual mistakes. 
and made decisions. And I'm, again, I'm just making this up. My mama sat in this section last night, okay? <laughs> and, and somewhere in this section is of the 9,000 people, it's what we run in the summer, 9,000 people who will be at Church by the Glaze. You're the person with the most baggage. You've made the, all these sexual choices, and it's just kind of messed you up, and there's all kinds of dysfunction, all kinds of brokenness, all kinds of addiction, maybe STDs. If you're the messiest person in the house, know this. We love you, and God loves you, and I'm thrilled you're here. And my purpose is never to judge or condemn. That's not my role. I want you to move forward with less regret in your future. I want to help you deal with your guilt and give that to God and see the power of God's forgiveness. So we're all, so, and you're somewhere in the middle, right? We're all somewhere, in the, we all have some regret in this area. So here is the purpose, not to judge or condemn anyone. And by the way, I want to say this. If what I say in the next few minutes you absolutely, completely disagree with, fine. That's, that's okay. I really feel like it's my calling before the Lord to take the Scripture and prayerfully and with love share the truth of God's Word. And if you agree with it, that is awesome. And if you don't agree, that is fine. Because once I've shared it, that's kind of on you and God at that point. So it's my job to share truth in love. It's your job with God to figure out how you apply that to your life. And if you completely disagree with everything I say, this is still your church. And I'll see you next week, all right? We're just going to disagree. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Judgment is not our job. And by the way, if you're in the heavy regret section, I love when you guys rock your CBG gear. I, I love when I go to the gym now and I'll see more people wearing Church by the Glade shirts than Nike shirts. That's awesome. <laughs> but a lot of your shirts say, no perfect people allowed. We mean that. Everyone has messed up in, in various areas, and this one is so profoundly human, we all battle with some degree of regret. And all God's messy people loudly said, amen, all right? Now, what's the Bible say about human sexuality? Three things, and I do dare you to take notes. Number one, sex is a God thing. I did not say sex is a good thing, though it is. It's a God thing. The Bible teaches with clarity that sex is God-created and god Ordained. Now you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Say it with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go ahead and find that. That's a little tougher find. That's New Testament. I'm going to go to the easier place in Genesis in just a moment. But the world has like this cultural presupposition that God doesn't know about this thing called sex. Someone should let God know about this thing called sex. It's really popular. It's really fun. So much. It's almost like someone else is responsible for sex. It's almost like they came up with a scenario that Hugh Hefner, Larry Flint, and, and Satan got together one night in Vegas and invented this thing called sex. Thinking, this is going to sell some magazines, right? We can, we, we can make money with this. And No. Sex is God's good idea. You stay in 1 Corinthians chapter of chapter... Chapter 6, I'll take you to Genesis chapter 1. What is God doing in Genesis? Basically, he's making everything. He's busy creating the universe. Now, in verses like 24, 25, he's making animals, and then there is a pause in the Hebrew. There's a breath, then he makes something very different. Verse 26, Genesis 1 is on the screen at every campus. Look what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our Great reading. In our image, when I say three, shout the word image. One, two, three. Image. Big idea. We are made in the divine image. Now, animals and stuff before are cool and awesome and great. And, and California redwoods are magnificent and blue whales are, ah, right, right. But only people made in this image. It says it again. In our likeness, they may, so they may rule over the fish. My verse right there, we should rule over the fish. Anyways, sorry, I'm a fisherman. Anyway, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. So this is Genesis chapter 1. Now sin does not even enter the human equation until Genesis chapter 3. So things are perfect. Exactly how God wants it. And God made us from the get-go in two varieties, male and female. He made the genders, boys and girls. So I would extrapolate from that. Sex is not just something we do. Sex is actually what we are. In fact, it's so intrinsically human. What's the first question you ask about a new baby? Boy or girl? Oh, actually, you ask, what is it? What is it? No one ever says, what is it? It's pink and gooey and screaming. No, they always say what? It, it's a boy. 
it's a girl. The first question asked and answered about you probably was about your sexuality. This is who we are. God made, I mean, even people who believe in a biblical framework for creation still can act like God's out of the loop on the whole sex thing. It's almost like somewhere in Genesis chapter two, Adam and Eve stumbled into the bushes, came back out 20 minutes later, all sweaty and flushed, going, hey God, you will not believe what we discovered. The body parts, they fit together. God's like, wow, really? I didn't see that. Well, no. God created sex. Sex is therefore a God thing. Now, now, here it is. Question, does God ever make anything bad? Not a trick question. I'll ask again, does God ever make anything bad or evil? No. Whatever God makes is good, is positive, is, is wonderful. All right, so if God made sex, if it is God ordained, I'll say it this way, what God has created is never X-rated. So some people think, you know, sex is like dirty or sex is bad or the Bible teaches sex is evil. Where does it even come from? Well, actually, that does come from the church. It's an erroneous theology. It's very old. It actually is based on Greek philosophy. It goes all the way back to the Greek philosopher Plato. Plato had this idea that everything that was spiritual was good. Anything physical or material was evil. And then there was this great theologian, actually a wonderful Bible scholar, been great on the scripture, a guy named Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas. But he had a lot of sexual baggage. In fact, he'd be sitting way over here in this section. He had a whole bunch. He was a womanizer and, you know, bounced from bed to bed. And so he gets saved, and he feels guilty about that. And so he kind of brought this Greek idea into the church. And so the church even taught the sex within marriage was somehow stained or tainted or, 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 or dirty or wrong. But that is not in the Bible. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, on the contrary, that God creates sex so it's, it's a good thing. In fact, I'll go further. Look at verse 28. Look at Genesis 1, 28. So in verses 24, 25, he's making animals and stuff. And then 26, 27, he makes people in two varieties, male and female. And then he says this, get ready. The word comes quickly. God blessed them. And ready? Here's how he blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Y'all know what God's talking about there? He's like, go have babies. Go have a bunch of babies. Be fruitful and multiple. Have a bunch of kids. Have a bunch. Now, to have a bunch of kids, you have to have a bunch of sex. God is saying, you go have a whole lot of sex. Oh, there's some brother going to tweet me for the first time ever right there. Lean into the wife and go, man, church, church is good today, honey. I like that pastor. Go have a whole lot of sex. What God has created is never X-rated. So we're learning that God made us sexual creature. God, God's the one that gave you your sex drive. Teenager, God blessed you with your hormones. Young adult, God gave you your passion. Middle-aged adult, God wired you up with your sex drive. Senior adults, God gave you your sex drive. God gave a sex drive to, uh, to, to uh, pastors, gave a sex drive to teachers, gave a sex drive to policemen. God gave a sex drive to your mama. Some poor kid going, no, 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 can't, can't get it out of my mind. No, he made us that way, and it is a good thing because it comes from God. God blesses us, and he makes us sexual creatures. It's a beautiful, blessed thing. Now, well, Pastor David, if sex is this great thing, why do you limit sex? Why do you have some rules around sex? Great question. Why is that? Here it is, because if sex is a blessed thing and a beautiful thing, and even I'm proposing an ordained and sacred thing, it's a precious thing. Let me show you. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll begin this conversation, verse 18 and following. The Apostle Paul giving an instruction, brilliant stuff. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Don't flee from sex, but sexual immorality, sexually uh, questionable choices. Here's why. Why? I mean, the Bible does the why. All other sins a person commits are outside his body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Interesting. Here's what's cool. Do you not know that your bodies, not your soul, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Get ready. You have been bought at a price. Therefore, because you've been bought at a price, therefore, honor God with your body. Here's the question. It's the price that God paid to redeem us. Not just redeem our souls, but redeem our, our bodies. Did God pay money? Did he pay gold? Was it silver? What was the price he paid? It was, it was Jesus. He gave the most precious thing in the universe to purchase your body. 
So the reason there are sexual rules and regulations and boundaries is this. You wrap boundaries around anything in life that you deem as precious. You place rules of protection around anything in life you value and esteem. Everything. So your body is one of the everythings that's precious. So that's why there are, there are some rules for that. Uh, uh, again, example. So it's graduation time. I got graduating seniors in the house. I have a graduating senior in my house. My son graduated. Like, give it up for the seniors right now. All the seniors <laughs> wrapping up high school, college. Awesome job. So my son, who's he's social, he said, Dad, I can have a few friends over and celebrate maybe on Thursday night and you know, have some food and stuff. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a party guy. That's not the way I'm wired. My home is my quiet, safe place. I have zero gift to hospitality. I should not be a pastor anyways. I shouldn't. But he loves me social. Yeah, you have a few friends over. There were 200 kids at my house. He invited his entire senior class. I guarantee it. We did have food. Padrino's Cuban, they, they catered for us. Man, some good food right there. And listen, I said, Charlie, you and your friends have a great time. There's no alcohol here, anything like that. That's fine. But the food, enjoy it anywhere. You can eat the food in the kitchen. Eat the food at the kitchen table. Eat the food in the family room. That's fine. I hope you eat the room outside. That's the best place. Eat the food outside. That's great. I said, the only place you can't eat the food is the living room. Because that's where the nice, expensive furniture is. And we're like a lot of those families, we had that empty living room for years, at least so they had like 10 years that we had literally nothing. It was like an echo in the living room. We finally got furniture, and it's nice, and it's white. It's not the color of black beans, so no food in the living room. So sure enough, I walked by like an hour into this little soiree, and there's a bunch of kids sitting there with their food in the living room. I said, Charlie, get them out of the living room. That's not because I'm uptight, though I am. That's because that stuff's expensive and we protect it. So we have some rules. God's not uptight. He's like, man, you are so valuable to me. You are so precious to me. Anything precious, you wrap rules around. We all here during the movie series, we had great attention. We did this movie series. It was a lot of fun. We did Jumanji. When I talked about Jumanji, we had this, this, this vase, this, this, this beautiful vase, porcelain vase. Remember that? I just noticed last night I'm wearing the exact same shirt. That's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I need more clothes. All right. Anyways, and I had this beautiful, I told you it was like 100 years old, talking about the artists and stuff. It was a one of a kind. It was this priceless thing. And then you all remember what I did right at the end? I took it and I, 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 I tossed it kind of casually. I threw it in the air to one of our tech guys. And when I did that, there was an audible gasp in the room. Like, oh, oh, right? And then you guys did the mad, like, oh, he's been pulling our leg. That's not a priceless vase. It's not a one of a kind. It's some like eBay cheap. And it was because you would never handle something priceless and rare and valuable in a casual way. So why are you casual with your body? Why are you casual with something as intrinsically human as your sexuality? God says, I got rules for this because I love you. So what, what's the rule? Well, the rule, just to be really candid, is marriage. Let me show you in the Bible, word of God, man. Don't, don't my opinions, who cares? But what God thinks matters so much. In Hebrews chapter 13 Verse 4 says this. It says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage... I like that. Like, only three people reading at this point. <laughs> Let's write it again. Comma. And the marriage... Excellent. To be undefiled. So what God is saying is the place you, you express yourself fully. Man, have a great time. Knock yourself out. Sexually is the marriage bed. What is marriage, biblically speaking? Marriage in the Bible is a man and a woman in a covenant relationship for life. But the court says, but the society says, I, I, I get that. I respect people who disagree. But biblically, time and time again, that's how marriage is defined. In the marriage bed is a place we express ourselves sexually. <laughs> again, if you're watching on TV, even though it's such an awkward clap, it's awesome. Listen, this is hard to talk about, but we got to talk about it because guess what? The world's talking about it. The world does not hesitate, stutter, stammer, or blush when they talk about this. It's everywhere. It's in media. It's in music. We told you guys, if you're uncomfortable, you can have your little kids outside of the room. But guess what? They're hearing these messages and this sexual misinformation at very young ages. E example. So, so I'm driving Victoria to school here. She, she was attending Glades Christian. She was in a, a pre-K four or whatever it was. She, she was just four. In fact, I mean, she was just four. She had just been three like a week before. She would just turned four. And she's in the backseat of my car, and I'm driving her. We're talking about something. It had no relationship context at all. We're talking about romance or mom or dad. or you know, We're talking about SpongeBob. 
Now the blue, she shifts gears and goes, hey, uh, Dad, where do babies come from? I'm, my brothers. What do you do when your baby girl, who was four and she was just three like a week before, asks you that delicate question, where do babies come from? Where, of course, as a good father and your girl asks you that, you say, ask your mother. <laughs> to which my smart little daughter said, I asked mom last night. She said to ask you. gets better. A week later, I run into her teacher there and, you know, at the school, four-year-old teacher. Her name's Laura. And Laura catches me and says, uh, PD, you got to know that your daughter, we're talking about like math or something. She raises up her hand and went to a math question said, hey, Miss Laura, where do babies come from? In front of everybody. And she said, I didn't know what to say. I said, oh, sweetheart, you need to ask your mom and your dad. To which she replied, I asked my mom and dad. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. <laughs> And a lot of people kind of look at the scripture like, like God does not have a clue. No, God has a clue. And God has a plan. And God's plan is perfect. Now listen, I know, I appreciate you good manners because someone's going to go, no, you're so wrong on this. The sex is not a big thing. It's a physical thing. Yeah, why all the hang up? You're telling me marriage. I'm single. I'm not even dating someone. I, I, it might be 400 years till I'm married. I can't wait. Why? Do you do? why? It's, just a, it's just a physical thing. Why the big deal? It's just a biological function. Back to Genesis. God's making animals and stuff. Then in the Hebrew, there's a pause. There's a pause. It's like God goes, okay, angels, watch this. Think that was cool? Think that redwood was cool? Think that blue well was amazing? Watch this. I'm going to make people in two varieties, male and female, in my image. Meaning this. We're not like blue whales. We're different than, than deer. We're not the same as a grizzly bear. We are more than just more complex than an amoeba. We're a whole different thing going on. We're the only thing in everything created that's made in the divine image. I'll say it this way. You are not a part of the animal planet. I'm not hating on animals. I'm just saying humans and animals, biblically defined, are very different things. See, secular biologists would just say we're another mammal. We're more intelligent, we're more community-driven, but we're just another mammal, and sex is another biological function, period. That is not accurate. We are not animals. The Bible teaches we are something much, much, much more. Any animal lovers in the house? I'll get more specific or clear. Any dog lovers? Any dog lovers? All right, all right. I've been doing this for a couple years. I, I always joke that I, I, am, I am not a dog person. I'm a person with a dog, but I have not brought out the family dog for a while. So let's see if Rev the Wonder Dog is here. You guys want me to Rev? Come here, Rev. Come here, boy. Come on, boy. Oh, yeah. Come here. There you go. There you go. Sit, sit, sit. Oh, yeah. Here's the family pet. Once upon a time, man, Lisa, we had a bunch of pets. We had a parrot and a dog and a turtle and a little fighting fish, and the older I get, the less pets I have. And, um, and this, this, this is Rev. He's an Australian shepherd. He's the family pet. He's a really good, really smart dog. Now, when God made dogs, man, God was showing off. Dogs are awesome animals. God was very intentional. He made the animals. When God made white sharks, you know, and when God made majestic African lions, when God made the Australian shepherd, off his game when he made cats a little bit, but everything else... No, just kidding, just kidding, stop, just kidding, just kidding. But there is a pause and a break, and then we're instructed in Scripture three different times that people are made in the image of God. As remarkable as Rev is, he is a dog. Therefore, by definition in the Bible, he is not made in the divine image. He's something different. Now, let's talk about him and, and, and sex, if you will. The biologist in the textbook would tell you, well, animals, you know, people are animals. It's a biological function. It's little more. Uh, but, you know, the funny thing is they even recognize at some level that's not true. Rev? Rev? There you go. Come on, deal. Uh, they would recognize it's not true because they never talk about in those textbooks animals having sex. They never use those words, animals having sex. Animals mate. Animals spawn. So what's going on there is, is when those things happen for Rev, and by the way, he went to the vet, so it can't happen anymore, but if that happened for Rev, um, he's over it, he's fine, he's good. Um, when Rev is in that kind of 
relationship with another dog, right? For him, it's physical. Oh, yes. It's, it's physical. Uh, he brings his limited dog intellect. I mean, he's a smart dog, but your four-year-old's smarter than my dog, right? He brings, well, you know, dogs have, Heather, you love dogs. Dogs have some feelings. They, they are affectionate. They fear, right? When it thunders, man, it scares him to death. He's afraid. But, you know, there's nothing soulish about a, about a mating experience for a dog. But because we're made in the image of God, stay with me, we're multidimensional creatures. And everything important we do, we bring the fullness of the divine image into that experience. Meaning this, for a human being, sex is never merely just a biological or physical thing. It's always physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. You don't just bring your body into the sexual relationship. You bring a little piece of your soul into it. See, here's the cool thing is, that doesn't mean sex for Christians is bad. It means it's big. You bring the fullness of the image of God into every single sexual encounter. That, that's huge. So our theology has a very high view of sexuality. Our view of sex is big. Now, the world has a different view. is small. If you're out here and rejecting what God says about sex, your view of sex is small. You practice small sex. Your language betrays you. You're saying things like what? You're arguing your mind. It's just sex, small. It's no big deal, small. That guy, some of you in the frat house or locker room say things like, oh, man, I want to get me a piece of that. Now it's so small, you've reduced another human being made in the fullness of God's image into a collection of body parts to be exploited for your own sexual gratification? No, no, preacher, man. I'm practicing big six. I'm, I'm sleeping with lots of women. I'm bouncing from bed to bed. Funny, what do we call a guy like that? We call him a player or we call him a dog? A dog. <laughs> you are a human, not a hound. God's made you for more. Let's give it up for Rev. Thank you, Rev. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. There you go. There you go. There you go. He's close. <laughs> and there's somebody thinking, I, I, you know, David, I, I see your rhetoric. I see there's a reason why. I, I see you're recommending that marriage is a thing that is special and pure, and that's where we express ourselves. I, I, I know that's what you think I'd see. The Bible says that. It's a positive, not a negative. Yeah, I mean, it's a big view of sex. We bring the fullness of our humanity, all that multidimensional made in the image of God to the sexual encounter. But, but pastor, look, nobody out there is doing that. Like someone's thinking, oh man, our cute little pastor, they keep him locked away in the office all week long and let him out on Sundays. <laughs> he just, he bless his heart, he doesn't, doesn't know. Man, no, one, no one's doing it that way. No one's saving themselves for marriage. I'm not talking about booty calls, but my bae, we're together, we're committed. We may get married someday. We're test driving this thing sexually to see if it works out. Nobody's doing it this way. Everybody is doing something else. Okay, that statement, everyone is doing it some other, other way, is, is not a statement of truth. You're just describing majority opinion. How many times in human history has an entire society been absolutely wrong on an issue? Everybody, with few exceptions. You don't have to tell me, I, I spent part of my life as a young man in a refugee camp on the border of uh, a Central African country, uh, Rwanda, taking care of 900 orphans. Why? The cultural norm was in Rwanda during the civil wars, it was one tribe trying to exterminate another, and everybody in both tribes thought the other tribe was subhuman. They weren't people, they were vermin. Therefore, you exterminate them. I mean, everybody almost, few exceptions, few dissenters. I mean, the famous people, the media people, the politicians, the poor people, all had something they believed that was wrong. So it is sad, but <laughs> telling me everyone believes this or everybody doesn't make it right, just makes it popular. So here's my thought. So you want the same regret everyone else has? You want the same brokenness everyone else has? You want the same pain? You want the same messy first marriage followed by the messier second marriage and third marriage? Did you want that? I know it's extreme. But I think, I think if Jesus were here, so I, I know what I'm asking you to do is extreme. I just, I just think you're worth it. I paid a big price for you. And I don't think I was ripped off. You are worth so much to me. So here's a very 
critical area of life. It's not a small thing. It's a big, beautiful, blessed thing. My God created for pleasure and procreation. Protected. And if you disagree with everything I say, you're, you don't buy the Bible, you're not down with the whole biblical framework or, or, or Jesus says, you're not down for that. Let me just ask you a simple logical question. Say you chose to follow the biblical rules. Say you chose to conduct yourself in a way in a line with the teaching of Scripture and came to the vital part of your life you call your sexuality. If we met 10 years from now, if you came to church on a Sunday 10 years from now, question, if you did it God's way, would you have more regret or less regret? you'd have less. And that's God's game plan for you, to live your life with less regret, with less guilt, with less shame, with more promise, with more potential, with more joy, with more capacity to love. So you're precious. And because you're precious, God gives you some rules. He loves you. He's a good dad. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you so much for a congregation mature enough and honest enough and most importantly, courageous enough to have a candid conversation about a delicate and very personal area of life but father here is my prayer we'd be open we wouldn't judge anyone we'd recognize the forgiveness for God from God's pervasive for any mistake we have made that you're bigger than our regrets so Lord Jesus we thank you for who you are and finally think of relationships there's somebody here without their relationship with Christ is my prayer they'd make that move today and give themselves to the Savior we make this prayer in Jesus name amen